we were done. Um, I've spent the last pretty much 30 years, um, especially since I encountered my, my own Sufi teacher, a gentleman who was connected to three separate Iranian orders, uh, one of them a sub-branch of the Mahi order, and then one of the branch of the Kurdish Ladri order, and then one of the three famous Kalandari Khaksar order, um, immersing myself in a particular movement that he was also significantly simultaneously involved with uh, throughout most of his adult life. That is the Bayanis. Um, Western scholarship knows the Bayanis as an involvement. Interestingly enough, today I was skimming online a uh, book by American scholar Paul Johnson, uh, a book he wrote about uh, Blavatsky, uh, entitled The Initiates of the Theosophical Master. Um, this work was quite controversial in its time. Central argument of this book is that uh, he claims to have identified the uh, theosophical masters as actual individuals in the 19th century. And um, some of the figures that he identified are the figures that are associated by scholarship in uh, what Western scholarship classified the high form of the Bobby Baha'i movement. Um, except where I'm coming from, Sykes doesn't exist. Bobby and Baha'i, Bobby, uh, or what scholarship knows as the Azali Bobbies of the movement in own right, uh, due to the persecution and also because of the schism that occurred in the 1860s between themselves and the Baha'is, they went progressively under the uh, And just like uh, in the 12th, 13th centuries, when you have a lot of Ismailis, the Bhattis going underground into the orders after the Mongols, uh, the same uh, Paradigm kind of suffice in some way with the segment of the Azali Bobby or the Bayani, who went into uh, the Sufi paradigm, the Sufi orders of Iran. Not all of them, but some of them. My teacher was one of them. So when he found out about my own pedigree, especially about my own family pedigree, uh, because one of my ancestors was a, was a woman who was very much involved in the Bobby movement, a woman by the name of Horat of A. I'm trying to say that the Solace of the Eyes, who was renowned in her time as being the, the return, uh, not so much reincarnation, but the return of the archetype of Fatima, uh, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad. And our order, the order that I had today, and I found it um, as a consequence of the calling of my own teacher, the order known as the Fatima Yasser Order, uh, which pays homage uh, both to what I believe and to the return of Herself, the daughter of Prophet Muhammad. Anyone who knows anything about uh, Shiite esoterism will realize very quickly that within that terrain, uh, there are other parameters, other considerations uh, that kind of overturn the, the, the usually patriarchal associated uh, paradigm with the conventional of Islam. So, in essence, I myself am coming out of there. Strain of Islam and also a heterodox form of Islamic esotericism, which you know, Jordan will find out why. Um, but my teacher was uh, very much involved in Islam, and um, so when I got my initiation in 1993, I was initiated not only in the name of the master of the uh, outward, uh, uh, what they call the ijaza or the transition, but also he initiated in the name. Of the law, his successor, Sopa Azami, and also in the names of the letters of the The Bayani movement emerges basically on the back of another movement known as the Shaykhi Sufi. Sufi was a Gnostic movement that emerges in the end of the, of the 17th to 18th century. And um, both uh, was involved in a very esoteric and Gnostic enterprise, while some simultaneously uh, a very millenarian and shiniastic. Um, these days, a lot of the members and adherents of Shiva people try to minimize the more esoteric and shiniastic of their founders' doctrine, but Sheikh Ahmed al Asai, a Bahraini Shiite uh, cleric, uh, basically, without intending to, um, inaugurated a school which uh, he called the Tashfiyah, 
are, are those who disclose the truth um, and which uh, conventional scholarship knows as, as the Sheikh Hizmi. And in 1844, um, after the passing, his holy successor, Sayyid Khazim Rashi, um, a group of disciples of his, probably the disciples of his, came to a life in the city of Shiraz. And one of the members of the Sheikh Hizmi was actually a merchant, uh, a young 24 year old Sayyid, uh, meaning someone from the family of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, proclaimed a cause on May 23rd, 1844, uh, to whom history has now known as in posterity as the Bab or the Bab. The Bab's um, doctrine was also an extremely esoteric doctrine, but even more so in many elements uh, than the Shafi school. It was completely Kabbalistic, so the science of letters, letters from Latria, the very center element of this doctrine. As it was to some degree, most of the, uh, the mystical and esoteric streams of Islam, but with the Bob, it was taken to another level, um, whereby the letters and, and uh, numbers constitute, in essence, sort of like tonic ideation you know, in, in the world of America. Um, this movement um, had a very tragic ending. The state and clergy in Iran um, came down on it very hard, and um, mostly because. The Babis um, also, in some sense, were attempting a sort of revolution in Iran, uh, in overthrowing the power structure, both the power structure the clergy and both the, the ruling dynasty of the Kamil and the other. And um, before the Bab was executed in July of 1850, he nominated a young, um, at the time, he was only 18 years old, uh, 18, 19 years old, uh, son of a former courtier connected. For the dawn of pre eternity. And um, I have been studying Shabazal's works uh, consistently, uh, pretty much from the zero, from the beginning of the zero, when I um, started to get access to a lot of true uh, members of this community who are still around in Iran and began to uh, piecemeal translate the items here and there. Um, in 2011, I was invited by uh, uh, the SOAS in London, the School of Oriental African Studies, uh, to give a lecture on Babism, which I did, uh, entitled Post Gnostic Apotheosis. And basically, this movement of, of the Bayanis um, can be characterized as a form of post Islamic heresy. Now, when I use that epithet post Islamic, I don't mean post as in a rupture with Islam. When we talk about post, we have to kind of um, contextualize in the same way a lot of scholars contextualize postmodernism. Postmodernism is a continuation of the belief. Um, it's sort of uh, you know, going beyond the, the set parameters of what the is, but very much uh, within that world. And the Bayan is very much. Um, Kind of following that frame as far as post Islamicity is concerned. And these texts are, in my opinion, as also the story of Genesis 2 and 3, are some of the most interesting and rich uh, texts that exist. Unfortunately, because uh, the Baha'i schism came more dominant in the West, um, the, the Baha'is have sort of overshadowed the Bayanis. And it has only been since probably the zeros and particularly. When the website was launched, uh, Bionic.com, that um, the public of art trying to realize the Bionic community was still around. Um, the late Peter Lamborn Wilson, also known as Hector today, a social friend of mine, um, uh, came into the Bion as of the year 2020 when he was in contact with me uh, by a friend of his and expressed his interest in the Bion. Um, apparently, this is not part of his biography, and I'm going to use this. And this resulted in the result of the correspondence between the public court and I have been having uh, since 2014. I have been sending some texts, find my articles that have been reviewed uh, and elsewhere. And in his last two days, he said, he passed away this last day. Uh, he both acknowledges me and both explains that I am the Bible. Of the, the Babis or the Abeli Babis, 
Um, and in a sense, he's correct because what the Platonia is a revival of precisely um, both the esotericism and both the direction, uh, trust uh, of social transformation that the Platonians themselves were originally pushed for. One of the texts of Sofa Azal that really caught my interest early on. Uh, that was first uploaded by the members of the Bayon community in 2007. And this text is very rich because, in a very condensed 68 page uh, discourse, Sofa Azam uh, basically lays out a visionary journey within um, certain elements of, of Shakti and Bobby metaphysics that I find very interesting. But rather than most conventional Sufi yes test that said this course of the provisional request for the first of the crown of uh, this particular text works its way from the top down. So it works from the first principle of things, which is the world of um, the final will uh, or the sun of reality, and then works its way down to the world of, of, of matter or the, the facial temple. Let me talk a little bit now about Sufa Azar himself. Um, his preeminent title in reference to the fifth theophanic sequence of the Hadith Kumail, the Hadith of the Hadith, the description of the ultimate reality, Mirza Yahya Nisuk Azam, died in 1912, and was born in the Arab in 1831 during the final years of the reign of Hassan Shah Ajah, who died in 1834. He was the son of the wealthy Muslim. Other than on the project of Kutir in Liverpool, and in the upper support of the Uri, and his sixth wife, Kucha Khan, came on to who died in great childhood. After his birth, Suha Azam was impressed with the care of his father's sixth wife, the mother of the teacher, Bahá'u'lláh, and founder of the Red Sky. Before his third birthday, and at the commencement of the reign of Muhammad Shabbat Shah in 1928, Suha Azam's father also died and the tears of his care and upbringing. So from this period onward, henceforth he pressed closely to his stepmother and his aforementioned stepbrother, who was 13 years of his senior. In the same year as the commencement of the Bobby movement, before, his stepbrother, stepmother died as well. And so guardianship of Sufa Azal, about 14 years of age, evolved upon his older brother. According to Sufa Azal's own testimony, his conversion to Bobbism occurred. Approximately during the period of using the gain informative momentum and building the basic number between years of 1834 and 1846. In 1847, when the Bob Biggest followers joined his chief and his initial disciple in what he wanted to do for us, so as a young adolescent of 50 years, immediately set out on his own to the Khan, joined the other body part of their assembly. In 1848, and nine, uh, as the big commotions involving uprisings were occurring, Suba Azam began corresponding with the Bab himself. The writings and correspondences of Suba Azam were soon esteemed highly by the Bab as divinely inspired. I was called versicle signs of ayat, issuing from the former's pure innate knowledge or fiction. And so, in a series of testamentary epistles that were publicized widely among the scattered so that Azal was formally nominated to the Bob's successor as Lehi and Mirror of Milan, whose status would be complementary to the Bob's. In other words, Sofa Azal was to be to the movement that the Bob initiated the Bayan, was to be an Ali in the Shiite context to the Bob's Muhammad. It is worth quoting here a few passages from what the Bob said to Sofa Azal in his testimony. He says to him, you are I, and I am you. He and I, he and you. God, and I am God, and you are God. This is a book from God, the protector of the peerless, the God, the protector of the peerless. This is the book from, from Ali, the poor Nahir, the remember of the world, unto, unto he whose name is given the name of one. Wahi, the remembrance to the world. O name of the one, now this time of me, protect that which has been revealed in the Bayan, the command part, for verily thou art a mighty way of truth. 
At noon on July 8, 1850, the ball together with the disciple were publicly executed by a fire in front of the Catholic military guard uh, following the heresy trial that had occurred in August 1852, after a failed assassination of the life of Dr. Duchamp by the Barbican Revenge of the Law, so that I now fled to Baghdad. Later, in early 1863, the Ottoman government settled the property of the Ottoman Turkish oil, far removed from the Turkish oil. In early 1867, so Baha'u'llah emphatically, once they had been moved to the Turkish territory, Baha'u'llah and his older half brother emphatically made a claim to the supreme theocratic authority of the Bali, as a king, the Bali Messiah, and had a circle of partisans publicly ascended. Given that the effective machinery and apparatus of the Bali leadership was already in his hands, this challenge to Sofa Azal's authority proved like none other before. Sofa Azal immediately and unequivocally denounced his older brother's claim, the matter of escalating the violence and part of the high development. The complete split of the two factions was affected by September 1867. Two notable attempts appear to have been made by the Baha'i to murder Sofa Azal. Other loyalists of Sobhaza were not so lucky. Uh, the British Orientalist E.G. Brown, summarizing the book Hesh to Hesh, states, I quote, all prominent supporters of Sobhaza who stood here to defend Ali Baha'u'llah's claim to march out to death, and in Baghdad, Muda Ajah, Ali Tahir, and his brother, Ajah Mirza Ahmad, Ajah Mirza Ahmad, and several others go one by one to march for the path. As to the assassination of the Abali, Abadan Bin, Adi Sayyid Muhammad of Isfahan, and Mirza Abdul of Tafrij, like some of Baha'u'llah's followers in Akkar, there can, I fear, be little doubt. The passage in Baha'u'llah's Kitabah Akras is the most holy book, alluding apparently to Haji Sayyid Muhammad's death, proves that Baha'u'llah regarded his death as some place. In August 1868, as a result of the communal violence that erupted between the two factions, the Ottomans banished him as of his family. Some of his remaining supporters closed for behind the island of Cyprus. While banishing Baha'u'llah, his family is supporting the important forces of Sadaqa to occur in Palestine. Zen, what about the teachings themselves? We're getting it. Oh, good. good. Yeah. Yeah, we're getting it. Um, for Sofa Azal, the next 43 years of his exile after 1868 would be spent in relative seclusion in front of his disciples, were surrounded by some of his family, and occasional groups like the Holy Council, and was to find some measure of peace. After an illness lasting nine months and aggressively worsening and surviving his older brother and rival by nearly two decades, Sofa Azal died at seven o'clock in the morning of Monday, April 29th, 1912. Approximately 81 years ago. He is buried in a lot adjoining Ahmed uh, Houston's common Muslim cemetery, then only a mile outside of the city now because inside the city of a small shrine has been built for the Um By my estimation, um, the number of works, full length works, authored by Sultan Azar during his ministry as the director of the law. Approximately presently, somewhere around the whole part of the works. Um, these are full length works. Some of them exceed a couple hundred pages. Um, most of them are written in Arabic, uh, although occasionally there are a few books in Persian. Um, he basically followed Bob's own uh, stylistic uh, composition. So, for example, we have many works uh, that occur in the style of the Quran. So, just like the Bob wrote. Um, and was accused of severity for that very reason. So that as I wrote works in that kind of uh, kind of high Arabic, scriptural Arabic, uh, he wrote numerous commentaries, uh, countless innumerable prayers, um, and a uh, few works, and discursive works in Persian as well. Three manuscripts are known of the present work, the seven worlds. Um, two are by in the hand of the author here. And one is but in the hands of the sun, because all their sun is on Ali. Uh, that particular copy is held up uh, manuscript form in the Bibliotheque Nationale de Paris. 
transnational library. Um, so these works have been cataloged. Um, unfortunately, very little study has been provided, and basically looking at this uh, material in any seriousness. The Seven Worlds, as I mentioned, is basically a book for a treatise that is dealing with the issue of the visionary quest. But a visionary quest within the confines of very particular interdisciplinary world. Um, and within this text, there are numerous correspondences. So the seven worlds correspond to how Soba Azad deals with the seven worlds, world, where in his metaphysics, the seven worlds are the very top the world of what texts call Hawut, the realm of the Psaiti, which in the Kabbalah would be the Ain Sof, uh, the Lahut. The divine world of proper, then the world of the Jabu, the imperium of power, or what the Islamic philosophy calls it, the um, disincarnate and archangelic intellects, the world of the Malaku, the world of the angels proper, and there's another world, Azamu, the mightiest realm, which is the realm where the um, So, Bazaz's metaphysics, and also in some of the metaphysics of, of, um, of Islamic Sufism. Is the realm where in heaven and hell are bifurcated. So the realm of Adam is actually administered by an angel rather than demons. There's no separation um, in Islamic eschatology between heaven and hell. There's two domains administered by angels. And in fact, in the verse in the Quran, uh, it states that there are 19 angels guarding the gate of hell. Then finally, the, the, the next two realms are the realm of the demons and the fourth, and then finally, Nasu. The, detail, the seven worlds details the visionary entry of a deep esoteric metaphysics, enumerating the mesocosmic and metacosmic realms, and the geosophy of the mundus marginalis, or all another problem, the imaginal world, in its descending hierarchy, within a general discussion of mystical ways of being, as per the featured esoteric landscapes of the Bobby scriptural universe. Each of these descending worlds are in turn other symbolized with one, the seven letters of the name Ali Muhammad, the name of Allah, who likewise hope is also known as the essence of the seven letters, that of the Hebrew seven. Then the seven Arabic letters of the divine seal, third, the seven creative attributed infants of the body, mentioned by the Shia Muhammad in the Shia Hadith culture. The seven Earths, the seven planets of traditional cosmology, the seven verses of the Quran, um, and other correspondence is in nature. All of this is rubricized within the general discussion of mystical wavering from the top down. Now, in a separate but contemporaneous work, which is called Prayer, Subha Azaz summarizes all of the details of his. Seven world in a prayer, which is absolutely gorgeous. And I translated this from the subject of an article I published in uh, 2014 entitled The Seven the Seven. And so I'm going to read you this prayer in full um, in the translation. In thy name, O my God, and high be thy state. Glorified art thou, O my God. Verily, I beseech thee by thy sublimity and its most supreme, for the totality of thy sublimity is truly high with thee. Then, with the mother of the utterance that is thine, O my God, I verily beseech thee by the whole of thy sublimity. Glorify art thou, O my God, verily I beseech thee by the banner of thy self subsisting peerlessness, by its highest elevation, for the complete standard of thy logos command is truly lofty with thee. Then, to the mother of the utterance that is thine, O oh my God, I fairly beseech thee by the whole of thy standard. Glorified art thou, O oh my God. Verily, I beseech thee by the plenitude of thy tremendousness at its most expansive. For the totality of thy plenitude is truly vast. Then, to the mother of the utterance that is thine, O oh my God, I verily beseech thee by the totality of thy plenitude. Glorified art thou, O my God, I verily beseech thee by thy kingdom, which is the utmost height, for the whole of thy kingdom is truly displayed to thee. 
Then he was the mother of the country and said, I, my God, I dare you to seek you for the whole of thy kingdom. Glorified art thou, O my God. Verily, I beseech thee by thy exaltation, at the acme of the exaltation, for the whole of thy exaltation is to pray. Then with the mother of the country, said, I, my God, I verily beseech thee by the quality of thy exaltation. Glorified art thou, O my God, verily I beseech thee by thy tender graciousness at its most primeval. For all of thy graciousness is truly ancient of thee. Then, with the mother of the utterance that is thine, O my God, I verily beseech thee by the whole of thy graciousness. Glorified art thou, O my God, verily I beseech thee by thy duration at its utmost ceaselessness. For the whole of thy durationlessness is truly constant with thee. Then, with the mother of the utterance that is thine, O my God, I verily beseech thee by the totality of thy durationless eternity. Glorified art thou, O my God. Verily, I beseech thee by the heavenly waters of thy pain, the heavenly waters of thy might, and the sublimity of thy power, and the world of thy lordship, and the supremacy of thy tremendousness. And by the heavenly waters of thy love, the heavenly waters of thy night and the banner of the sovereignty of thy self-sufficient period. And by the heavenly waters of the letter Yah, the heavenly waters of the plenitude of thy lordship, and the certainty of the essence of thy oneness, and the perfection of the arrangement of thy and the consummation of the logos command of thy singularity. And by the heavenly waters of the letter Yah, the heavenly waters of thy kingdom, thy successive dominions of all things, and the manifestations of thy law. And by the heavenly waters of the letter Ha, of thy penetrating decree, the good that should be created, and the life forever abiding in the world of thy subsistence spirit. And by the heavenly waters of the second letter, what thou hast placed upon it the state sublime, and the splendor of the imperium of power. And the majesty of the divine, and the luminescence of the angelic kingdom, and the supremacy of the world of mightiness, and by the heavenly waters of the natural, the perpetuity of the sovereignty of thy holiness, and the prominence of the southern rule of thy glorification, and the durationlessness of thy glory itself, and that which thou hast placed upon it, of the perpetual state in the realm of thy divinity. And the vestigial signs of the sovereignty by substance peerlessness. And by these, the seven heavenly waters and the seven worlds, and the magnified spirits of holy, and the metaphysical prehensions of greatness and likeness, and the epithetic setting placements of grandeur and power, and the binding knots of mercy, severity, and southern dominion. And the manifestations of grandeur, and what thou hast placed upon the sublime majesty and wealth, and the apogee of beauty, and the countenance which was thine, that is risen. I beseech thee that thou mayest bestow upon me what thou hast placed upon them of beautific excellence, and thy spiritual attraction of glory, and the noble, beneficent existence, O possessor of the Glorified art thou. No other God is there besides thee, for I beseech thee, O my God, by that which I have imputed to the area four times, of thy greatest name and thy gracious spirit, and thy versical signs of primordial might, and thy exalted and bounded over full and heavenly water. I beseech thee that thou mayest ordain from the foundation by thy local self from the force, temporality. That thou mayest bestow upon me from thy presence the heavenly delight, the divine proximity, and the sovereignty with thee that is victorious and sure. And I beseech thee that thou mayest dignify my soul above all things by thy self sufficiency. For what thou hast created in the dominion of the earth, what thou hast fashioned in the celestial appearance, the material creation, and the cosmos. And I beseech thee that thou empower me within that purifying month of deliverance that is thine with what thou hast determined through thy lotus. 
and that thou account me among the company of those fasting, those prayerful, those elevated, those afraid, those sincere, those abstaining, those righteous, those striving, those informed, those ripened, those in the life of, those knowing, those still steadfast and those kind. No other God is there beside me. So bestow upon me, O oh my God, and my mercy that is most vast of thee. And for all of thy sustenance provided in thy sovereign and human participation. Glorify art thou. No other God is there beside thee. Blessings be upon the point of the manifestation, just like thou hast shed blessings upon them from the blank of free eternity and the sublimity of thy mortality. Glorify art thou. Verily, I am of the invokers. That is the prayer of the seven worlds. Now, break down these seven worlds. So, as I begins the treatise by talking about the world of the divine will, the realm of the Mashiach, because in the Indian body, God is radically transcendent. Um, there, you cannot talk about it in kind of philosophical categories. Uh, just like in Kabbalah, when we're talking about the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, etc., uh, in the body of metaphysics, the body of the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. What we can, however, talk about is the divine will, or the primal will of the Bible, uh, Mashiach al Waliya. If, if you compare it with the text of the Bible, it refers to the universal age. So, uh, the first world, the world of the Mashiach, and then he corresponds. So the world of the Mashiach um, is related to Sunday and to the letters Ain and Kaf. And the first verse of the Fatima, the first verse, of the first sorry, chapter of the Quran, which is in the name of God, compassionate. Um, and this is then corresponds as a sort of a mirror, the world of the will corresponds. Um, or relates to the world of the Ipsayan. Now, in, to relate this and to correspond this to the valleys of Sufism, uh, this first one would correspond to, uh, to the realm of annihilation and subsistence. We're in way at the top of the journey. Annihilation and subsistence. Now, I should mention that the way that I have considered, especially with some of the uh, in the system that I have developed, it's slightly different from that. Uh, generally, the idea is the same. The next world, number two, is the world of the volition. So we have the world of the will and then the world of the volition. Now, in Islamic metaphysics, there are two different kinds of will. Uh, there is the, the, the active will, and then there is the, the passive will. And one is the actual manifestation and volition of the Raga is the more passive element. So it is, the, the, it is that which has been acted upon by the final. So this is the next world. And so Bazal relates that to the planet Mercury and Wednesday and the letters of Ulam and Nu. Uh, and the second verse of Fatiha is the first of Quran, praise be unto God, the Lord of the world. This would correspond to the sixth Valley in conventional Sufi metaphysics, which is the valley of the ruler of Aina. Number three is the world of the determination, Abba. And so that as that relates this to the plan of Venus, and obviously Friday, letters Ya and Fa, and third verse of the Fatima, the compassionate mercy of And this would then correspond to the world of the empyrean world of the heavens. Which is the world of the uh, abstract archangelic influence. This would correspond in Sufism to uh, the level of the unicity of Halloween. Number four is the world of the uh, divine authorization, Azza. And so far, Azza relates this to the moon, so obviously Monday, the letter of Mim and Yah, and the fourth verse of Fatima, sovereign of the day. And this is related directly to the angelic Malak, which then in turn corresponds to the value of sufficiency, is stigma in the supervisionary. 
Number five is the world of the divine creation, if, which is also called the world of the divine God or the world of the divine creation. And so as the race is Mars and Tuesday, the letter is Ha and the fifth verse of the Bible. To be to be there to worship and from to be and this is he relates to the mightiest world. This is the world where, like I said, heaven and earth held the earth, uh, guarded by angels. And this is related to the third valley, the original which is the valley of the most place, Wadi al -Mari. Number six is the world of the appointed time or the allotted time, Ajan. And so far as that relates this to Jupiter, so Thursday, um, the lectures mean and wall. And so on the sixth verse of the Bible of the book, Tehina Saratan is guide us upon the straight path. This in turn corresponds to the world of the Dominion. Mulk, which in Sufis, in, in the Sufi vision request, is the valley of one ish. And finally, the final world. Is the world of the cosmic book, the God. This so far as out relates to Saturn, so obviously Saturday, and the letters Dal and Nu. In the seventh, the final verse of the Fatima of the Quran, the path of those upon whom thou hast bestowed grace, not those upon whom thou hast shown wrath, or those who have done so. There are the Levina and the This corresponds to the material world proper, the world of Nasser, the material world that we're in at the moment. In the treatise, in the proper treatise of the seven worlds, this all follows part of a spiritual idea, itinerary of the itinerant seeker, uh, seeking to know the reality of the God and the God of the spirit. But the way that Sophazam has crafted it, he works from you know, he works on the bigger principles. So it's a kind of a eight and logical uh, for sure um, reason. Um, and then it comes back down to earth. So we get, we start with the world of the community, the listening, the temple, uh, the secret located there, and then kind of fall as it were into the world of matter and its conflict and all the, all the rest of it. But what is interesting is that all of this entire discussion in the treatise um, ultimately comes down to one thing. That one thing is the figure of the Bob himself. So this treatise basically revolves around what in Sota Azal's eyes are the reality is the reality of the prophets and who um, disclosed to the one who comes to believe it, such that Sota Azal as the Bob's mirror. Then basically opens up as that vehicle of the realities that he would talk about himself. This is basically the, the piece of this. I've done four drafts of this. Um, back when I was living in Berlin, in 2016, uh, one publisher was interested in this. At the time, I decided I would not publish the final report on it a little bit more because there is so much um, material in this that we can pick out. And comment about the thought um, I would wait a while longer for uh, putting this out. But this is basically much of Tobazal's uh, treatise of the Southern World. The prayer kind of gives you a taste of, of what the main treatise itself is discussing. Um, I, I'm actually in rapture with this thing, even though I've, I've read very widely the panorama of, of uh, Islamic Islamic again. I keep going back to this particular text over and over again, um, particularly as it speaks to me to the point that there was at one point a few years ago I was reading many of the, the, the episodes that he disclosed of this world that there one one particular part of it is in the second one talks about the world of the coalition with its 70,000 sons, you know. Um, and I had my own vision of his experiences in the world and seeing some of the stuff that he has talked about. So I'll leave it here. My lecturing at this point, if anybody has a question, please feel free. Yeah. 
Proceeded. And was pressed. Yes, but it's very painful. Okay. Let me write this down. The body movement began in 1844. The body of the point of Sopa Adal's Sopa Adal's older brother, Baha'u'llah, the founder of Baha'i. A schism occurred in the Ottoman Turkey. Um, Baha'u'llah claimed to be, um, because it's in the Bayani text, there's a figure that the Bab prophesizes that appears in the future. Um, which he calls people Dutch and and um, uh, there were a few claimants to this position even during the very early stages of Sobat Sal's ministry, but all of the claimants went nowhere. But Sobat Sal's older brother made that, that claim in the Ottoman Turkey and managed to basically then create a permanent skip uh, in the movement. So the Bayanis or the Azali Baldwin went one way, most of them went underground. Uh, whether it was a or the government of activism. Uh, the Iranian Constitutional Revolution of 1905 was very much spearheaded uh, by the Bayani community. So, um, interestingly enough, that the discourse of constitution, democracy, and rights was actually brought into the Middle East through the Constitutional Revolution of 1905. And it was the Bayani or Azali community that spearheaded it, working very diligently over a the Baha'is went in a different direction. Um, arguably, they kind of fell in front of the imperial powers, uh, including the Russians, then the Tsarists, uh, and then finally, after the First World War, the British Empire. So in, in, they basically, the Baha'is in many ways became a uh, kind of one of the uh, you know, soft powers of the Anglo American imperial powers, and then set themselves. But by all means, Continued in another book in Iran. Um, much of the reformists uh, and you know, liberal democratic systems coming out of the, the period after the Constitutional Revolution um, appears to be from people who were in some way either the founders of the period, the earlier generation of the uh, uh, or they themselves were outright. For example, uh, a very noted prime minister, um, the young man who actually negotiated. Uh, the abdication of Reza Shah the first when the British and the, uh, and the Soviet invaded Iran in 1941. Muhammad Ali Khalifa. Now, um, most of the uh, discourse in President Iran earlier is still to help the Christ to craft the be as a premix, and he was a premix, but he was primarily a humanist family of Bayani, as a result. And were it not for his efforts and his intersection, not only would the British and the Soviets have pushed um, Reza Shah out of power, they would have done anyway, but um, Iran would have more than likely become faulted by both the British um, and the Soviet Union. Remember that the, the pattern is Reza Shah, even though he was brought to power in 1921 by, by the British, um, and the Soviet Union, um, you know, as we were leading into the Second World War, Iran began to, you know, kind of Little too cozy to come from the visionary in the Soviet And uh, because of the warm water and the oil uh, and the possibility that if there had been a Nazi you know, presence in Iran, they could have been won the war against the Soviet Union at that point. Uh, the, the British and the Soviet Union invaded Iran the Second World War. He opposed the king at the time, but he kind of became a broker. He negotiated a settlement, sent uh, Reza Shah out of Iran. He did that in Tikta. Younger son Muhammad is on the king. Um, and you know, basically, security uh, was being cut up and balkanized by the British and the West. It almost happened several times in the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. During the period of Muhammad Mosaddegh, uh, the nationalist premier of Iran, who was elected, um, there are several other individuals within the cabinet that had family with the Bayani. There's some speculation about Mossadegh himself. I don't believe that is the case. Um, but there's definitely speculation about his foreign minister, a very radical minister, uh, Dr. Fatimi. Dr. Fatimi would have become the natural successor of Muhammad Mossadegh after the 1953 coup d'etat. He was um, 
arrested and then later executed following the That's right. Yeah. In terms of what took longer that, I mean, obviously we don't know. It's very close to your heart, yeah. this information. How has that affected you spiritually? In every conceivable way. What, what does it do to you and what's the process that by taking on could you ask this question? Spirituality, especially the spirituality in my part of the book, unfortunately seems to fall into a very common trap. And that is that um, it falls into a very reactionary, conservative, statist, and almost oppressive kind of trap. We've seen this many times. It is a tension that even exists, not to this degree, but um, to some degree, among between the official uh, orders of Iran and those. Yeah, that's sort of affect you. It affects me in that because I am in the presence of not only deep spirituality, but also of the social justice and social progressive message. But it's not um, progressive, but it's not going to deal with it. It's not going to, you know, but it's not going to follow the trajectory of looking at as, as the past as being the goal. And this has been a, a, this is part of the metaphysics of Bothersome because it sees, um, God's actions in history, the presence of God's theophany of history as a work in progress. So the theophany, the manifestation of God, is continually perfected. Because, for example, if you look at um, one of the very eminent uh, theoretical opponents of theosophical society, the French, uh, Rene Gaynon, in the traditional school of Islam, um, their point of departure meant work backwards. So that, you know, the golden age of everything is the beginning of the Mahatmara. It's basically laying out the Hindu concept of the Mahatmara. And that there is a fall in time. Well, Islamic metaphysics doesn't look at these issues that way. And which is why I have always found it strange that in my part of the world, people have been falling into these traps. Because there's a very famous hadith, um, much cited by the Sufi where um, God is speaking with the first person, he says, do not invade the place of time, where the God is come. Right? So not only is the God who God has defined the places um, in a, a, tem a temporal way, but we can actually know God within time itself, which is a very, in some ways, you correspond to your pentacles, it's a very scary concept. But with the metaphysics of the Bible, we still have that, this is, um, this is, Fleshed out in an extremely symbolic architectural way for radio um, table. Um, but on, in other areas, you're also in the presence of a system that can very easily discord something like Marxism from a spiritual position rather than from an antagonistic position. That's an effective view. In every way, yeah. I can agree. Yeah. Can you explain that? Well, um, Rumi's got a great book where it says, I can talk about, you know, um, I can talk discourse about all things, but when I come to love it myself, I become shy because, you know, this is such a vast, vast topic. Um, to get to know these people through their writings um, brought me into the presence of what divine love actually means. Um, because through my teacher, it opened, you know, people, a lot of people speculate about having visionary experiences, but the doors that he opened up to me, to the you know, empirically to study, um, literally tweaked my consciousness of things as they are. You know, showing me that there's a much bigger um, agenda, as it were, larger, divine agenda. 24 7, that we have to be seen. Um, some of these occur within one's pedigree, some of them outside of one's pedigree. Other times they become a marriage of various pedigrees with a single person that they can take in. I mean, I can go on and on sit here for the next week talking about each element. Um, so this is alchemical, and this is. You know, what is interesting, the very first, the night before my initiation, I've already had my conversation with her. The night before my initiation had a very, very good experience. And I was in Mecca. It was a full moon. There was absolutely nobody there. 
the door of the Kaaba opens up, and a woman's voice tells me to come in. So I go in there, and there is Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, which I said is then known to be the return of my great ancestor, sitting there in green with a white veil that it has written on it in my name, I it. She tells me to sit in front of her. I sit in front of her. She takes the very famous sword of Ali Yoko, the one that the sword. Tells me to take the, puts her hand in my mouth, then lacerates my tongue with that sword. Next episode of the dream, I'm in a world where it is a world completely luminescent and old and built up of flakes of gold. And as the sun rises, it's her face. This time I'm veiled with the sun itself. And as it rises higher and higher and higher, the sun starts to become a tree. Then I start to wake up. And then the sun, the actual physical sun, comes to shine into my extra window into my face and wakes me up. I'm supposed to go in a few hours after take the actual day I have for my future. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Um, no, no, no. I think we're all the same. No, no, no. Yeah, they do. This is actually one of, one of the things that I'd like to do is to look for. Closely at that, so that in, in my notes, in future publication of this thing, all of that is kind of there to correspond to the various systems of the world that I've been creating. Uh, so that's actually my intention to do precisely that very thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just great. It's great when you're, you're sitting and reading these things corresponding, but you know, meditating on, on what all of this means, you know, about that kind of thing, you know, what I find that great when you pray for anything. Any uh, questions about they do. I mean, the, the number 361 itself, um, whether we're talking about conventional Islamic democracy or the system of the law, it means the all things. So the word all things from the Shaykh is 361. Um, and if you look at the, the numerology of that word, the number 361 is 1900. Uh, 19 itself is a very central number in the Quran, and also the most central number in the system of Quran. It's the number of letters that begin in the Quran itself, which means the addiction is just endless to your speculating. Um, and it's also numerical value of one itself, one, and also existence, which is. Yeah. Yes. Good, good, good that you asked this. I'm actually the author of the whole Kabbalistic tree of 13, um, 13 spheres and 36 paths. Which takes takes full pathway to forty nine. Um, the decad, you know, the ten the decad is a system that, um, if you look at the history of of, of Nazi numerology, that the use in the Greek really is that. Um, but you know, other systems, whether we're talking about India, China, or elsewhere, didn't necessarily constitute those kind of things. So, is you know, this has been a debate going on for a long time. Whether the dead cap is actually for the perfect you know, kind of set. Um, even in, in certain Kabbalistic texts, you know, there are 
Hashem is not necessarily the perfect. He's the Torah itself. The Bereshit Sohab is the um, thirteen limits. This is also one of his great system of the Um So I work on in stages of developing the system of Kalot, which is associated with this tree of thirteen pounds and thirty-six. Uh, the, 13 spheres and 36 pounds. Um, and the way I have divided the system is that we have, um, I have a major arcana, I have a middle arcana, and a minor arcana. The minor arcana is four, as well as the, the suits of air, fire, water, and earth. Uh, the middle arcana itself is related to um, the, the, the 13 spheres, and then there are 49. Uh, or sorry, there are 28 uh, major arcana cards in that system that are controlled by projections of um, the lunar mansions uh, in, in the Islamic system of the Islamic system. Can I compare with the ancient Hebrew language? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, very much. But in the Arabic, yeah, but in the Arabic system, in Arabic, you have twenty-eight minutes. If they have the they if they don't have the license, the number one is the first one to zero. And the leader of the And there's much history of going to this is this is a they're actually up by more than that. For example, if you compare the tarot of the book on the tarot by Elephant Slendy, right? You know, he um, doesn't take on board the concept of zero, so he's been straight to the This has been the question of being like the ground between zero, or is it Aleph? And if it's Aleph, then it has to be one that has to be zero. Um, you know, once we move into someone like Elephant Crowley, he's going to be able to speak to me. I have decided that um, that it was time to move beyond that, but there's reasons that also a lot of studies and scholarship that are done on this now is beginning to prove that the genesis of this system began in North Africa. And more than likely would have been most um, Sufi, particularly given the fact that the Taloshi um, playing cards that then become Talo um, start to appear in the 17th century, around the 13th century. A great um, American scholar of Sufism in Arabi, um, Gerald Elmore, actually penned a series of articles before he passed away, um, where he actually argues for that. He bases it on the full card and uh, the sun card, particularly. Um, and he claims that, um, in fact, there is a lot of evidence in Carol for the doctrine of Ibn Arabic, the, the great Arabian Sufism, the original, what would have been the original power. Yes. Well, I mean, they, they were trading. Yeah, for sure. 
Well, for sure, well, they were training for when there's evidence. Um, but North Africa for a 400 year period was where they were putting the up the ship. So more than likely, um, yeah. And then, and then the Norman Yeah. Which had, you know, long distance. Look, I just want to uh, let everybody put their hands together. It's obviously starting to. Thank you very much for that.